So we're going to look uh, more closely at the ending of Life of Pi, and there's certain things uh, that we can talk about. So we're going to talk about the the landing of their lifeboat in Mexico. So both Pi and Richard Parker will survive the 227 days aboard the life raft and land in Mexico. So we'll talk a little bit about the goodbye scene or the lack of goodbye uh, between Pi and Richard Parker. We'll also uh, talk more specifically about the interview of Pi by the two uh, transport ministers uh, from Japan. And then we'll talk about some of what Pai talks about uh, in his interview. So he will eventually give a second story of survival. So we'll get more into that. Uh, we'll talk about elements of believability and fact and fiction. And then I want to look at uh, the element of allegory that's also a part of this story. So those are the elements that we're going to talk about uh, as we wrap up our discussion of Life of Pi. So the sort of ending of their 227 days, it's kind of an unceremonious experience for Pi and it kind of lacks a little bit of closure for him because uh, when they land in Mexico there is you know, it's not a long goodbye between Pi and Richard Parker. Richard Parker almost immediately, uh, you know, jumps onto the beach and then uh, walks away down the shore and then into the jungle. And the whole thing does feel a little bit incomplete or unsubstantial for Pi, and he, he struggles with that uh, for a long time, uh, how he was unable to sort of give closure to the experience and give a final kind of speech or you know thank Richard Parker uh, for helping him. So uh, he describes the disappearance of Richard Parker on page 315. So he ran a hundred yards or so along the shore before turning in. His gait was clumsy and uncoordinated. He fell several times. At the edge of the jungle he stopped. I was certain he would turn my way. He would look at me, he would flatten his ears, he would growl. In some such way he would conclude our relationship. He did nothing of the sort. He only looked fixedly into the jungle. Then Richard Parker, companion of my torment, awful fierce thing that kept me alive, moved forward and disappeared forever from my life. I struggled to shore and fell upon the sand. I looked about. I was truly alone, orphaned, not only of my family, but now of Richard Parker, and nearly, I thought, of God. So there is this kind of difficult ending of this important relationship with Richard Parker not making any kind of gesture, or there is no sort of goodbye at all. He just disappears forever into the jungle disappears from Pi's life uh, and the way he describes Richard Parker in this scene so he says companion of my torment awful fierce thing that kept me alive so once again he's reiterating you know the the presence the important presence of Richard Parker uh, in his survival experience so he credits Richard Parker with keeping him alive and uh, how Pi reacts to this goodbye is to weep. Uh, he says, I wept like a child. It was not because I was overcome at having survived my ordeal, though I was, nor was it the presence of my brothers and sisters, though that too was very moving. He just means there are other humans. Um, I was weeping because Richard Parker had left me so unceremoniously. What a terrible thing it is to botch a farewell. I am a person who believes in form and the harmony of order where we can where we can we must give things a meaningful shape so this is partly why he feels uh, sort of like there was a not a, a strong sense of closure for him he says Richard Parker had left so unceremoniously there was you know he thinks he botched the farewell so he could have said something to Richard Parker to thank him um, so he imagines you know if he had the chance to redo this moment he would have had
um, you know, the wherewithal to, to say thank you to Richard Parker. Um, and then he does that on page 317, so he imagines having that opportunity again and then saying to Richard Parker, um, you know, I owe you more gratitude than I can express. I couldn't have done it without you. I would like to say it formally. Richard Parker, thank you. Thank you for saving my life. And now go where you must. Um, so he would have liked to have thanked Richard Parker more uh, sort of formally and, um, you know, given Richard Parker the credit for saving his life. So there is this feeling of thankfulness, gratitude uh, towards Richard Parker for Pi credits the tiger with saving his life. And then after that we just have some descriptions of how Pi is saved by uh, some local, uh, local family who took him in. Uh, they bathed him, they fed him, and then they uh, you know, found, or they had, then he, they, he went to the hospital where doctors and nurses cared for him. Um, so that's where Pi is rescued. So he has survived, and this moment of saying goodbye is, is somewhat, you know, bittersweet, right? He has re-entered human society, but he has to also say goodbye uh, to that animal that was so important to him. And that was his companion uh, and shipmate for so long. So there is this moment of kind of leaving behind the animal, re-embracing human civilization. Uh, so you can't have both. Uh, you have to say goodbye to one of those. Um, and then Pi re-enters society, human society. Uh, but it's kind of a sad thing too, right? Because he's lost this friend forever. So the final part of the novel, part three, uh, takes place when Pi has landed in uh, Tomatland, Mexico, and he is interviewed by two men uh, from the Maritime Department in the Japanese Ministry of Transport. So there's two men, uh, Okamoto and Chiba. So these two uh, men, ministers of transport come to interview Pai about the sinking of the Simsum ship and just get his, uh, you know, version of events. So they're just interviewing the lone survivor of this ship shipping accident. Um, so they wanted Pai's uh, story. So they're going to record it and interview him and then they transcribe the interviews. And then on page 322, we have, again, Jan Martel, or our author's voice, uh, describing how these two men, in fact, he was able to contact them in, when he was in the process of writing the novel. And then he's going to include the verbatim transcript of that conversation. Uh, so everything we're reading in this uh, section is from that transcribed interview that took place uh, when Pi was rescued or when he, his 227 days were over. So this would be word for word the interview that uh, occurred between Pi and the two men. Uh, and there's it's an interesting interview. Um, you have the two men kind of more doubtful or skeptical of Pi's story when he does uh, tell it. Pi's behavior is kind of interesting too. He, he hoards any food that they give him and hides it under his bed so it does seem like he has been you know somewhat traumatized from the experience. He's you know hoarding food the way uh, somebody who you know has experienced deprivation might do uh, and he you know hoards food because he wants to save it for later. Uh, and he is, you know, it's precious commodity to him. Um, and then the two men seem very sort of skeptical. So Pi tells the whole story to them, I guess, at the top of page 324, which is the story that we've just been through um, of Pi's 227 days aboard the lifeboat with Richard Parker and how he survived that experience. So they get that story. 
and their reaction is interesting. They don't believe Pi, so they start, to, they question the reality of Pi's story with Richard Parker. And there's lots that they kind of poke holes in the story and say, well, how that can't be true. I don't believe this. Um, and then they point to certain pieces of evidence that they don't quite believe. So first they think, you know, bananas don't float. So if you remember back, Pi had said that the orangutan, orange juice, the orangutan floated on a pile of bananas in the Pacific Ocean when she first arrived on the boat. And then these two men are saying, well, that bananas don't float. That can't be true. There can't be an orangutan floating on a big pile of oranges or uh, bananas. So they have doubts for sure. That was one of the pieces of evidence. Second piece, they don't believe the island could exist. So at the bottom of 326, uh, they're talking about the fish-eating carnivorous island and the tree-dwelling meerkats. Uh, they say these things don't exist. So they're poking holes or trying to doubt or suggest that Pi has been lying uh, in his story. And then Pi insists, you know, this is what happened to me. Uh, just because you don't believe me doesn't mean it didn't happen. And, you know, sometimes there are things in this world that are unbelievable but still exist. Uh, so they have this almost like debate about the believability of Pi's narrative. And they go back and forth about whether or not... Um, you know, Pi, Pi's story is true, and he, Pi, on his part, is very, you know, defensive, and he makes, uh, he's sort of justifying his telling of the story and what happened to him, and he says, just because you don't, you've never seen that before doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, so the island is his evidence, so he says, uh, the men say, your island is botanically impossible, and then Pi uh, says, you know, he started backing it up and sort of saying, um, you know, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it, it can't exist. Uh, you know, there are things in nature and in the world that are, you know, beyond our rational minds uh, and could exist. Uh, and then another piece of the story that they question is Pi's... Uh, training and living on the life raft with uh, the Bengal tiger, Richard Parker, and they find that very hard to believe, uh, that Pi could have shared his boat with a wild animal like a tiger. And Pi's argument is, you know, any animal can be domesticated, uh, you know, he did his um, you know, he's, he grew up as the son of a zookeeper, so he has the skills and the ability, the knowledge to make that happen. Uh, and then they say they doubt the fact that Richard Parker, they would have found Richard Parker if, if he had, you know, gone to the jungle in Mexico. Um, and Pi just laughs at that because he, he knows or he thinks that, you know, it's naive of them to believe that there's nothing you know, that there's not wild animals in metropolitan places. And then uh, they, they also bring up the blind Frenchman as another piece of evidence that they doubt. Uh, so that's on page 332. Uh, so they find it very difficult to believe that Pi would have met uh, another survivor uh, a French, a blind French, uh, Frenchman, and Pi was also blind at the time, so this coincidence to them seems very far-fetched, um, unbelievable, and they they find it very extremely hard to believe. They said, um, so Pi, or they even question the fact what that that perhaps it was the cook aboard the Simpson, who was a Frenchman, and that soup they uh, that Pi met. And he doesn't, he doesn't agree or disagree with that. He says maybe it was. And then 
Uh, Pies, for his defense, he says there were meerkat bones in the lifeboat, and they can't disagree with that because there were little bones in the boat uh, that are unexplained. So they kind of are arguing back and forth whether or not Pi's story could be possible or not. And then uh, they ask Pi uh, for a second story, a real, or the real story is what they call it, but he says, uh, you know, he describes it in a different way. Um, so they want another story, they want to know what really happens, and Pi says, well, everything we say is really a story, so you just want another version of reality, uh, because, you know, the telling of something always becomes a story. So on page 335, Pi's you know, his intelligent way of looking at life and our construction of reality or perception uh, suggests that, you know, there's always more than one telling of the event of how it occurs. And if you think about it, you know, that's true of reality. Like we all have a different version of reality because we all would maybe tell a story or what, have, what happened in our own way. We all have our own perception of the world. So every there is no sort of objective reality, there's only subjective realities. And this is Pi's reality, so that's what he gave them. But they want to have a more, another version, or they want to know what really happened, and they're going to use, or they want words that reflect reality. Um, with no animals, so they want a story without animals that makes sense to them, and Pi describes it, so he says, I know what you want, you want a story that won't surprise you, that will confirm what you already know, that won't make you see higher or further or differently, you want a flat story and a mobile story, you want dry, useless factuality. Uh, and that, that line there should sound a little familiar to you, uh, the dry, useless factuality, um, because that's the, those are the same words that were used earlier in the narrative when uh, Pi was talking about a lack of faith. Uh, so if you go back to this chapter, so if you go back to chapters uh, 21 and 22 when Pi and the author were talking about religion and having faith, uh, Pi used those words, dry, useless, factuality, to describe somebody who is agnostic or who doesn't believe in God or spirituality or a higher power. Uh, and he does talk about uh, that having the lack of faith as dry, useless factuality. So that's the kind of story these two men want. Uh, so it's going to be more of a, a kind of atheistic story or agnostic story, one that confirms to a more, uh, I guess, real realism uh, that doesn't use animals or have animals in it. Uh, and then Pi sees this as like a dry, boring story. So they're going to, Pi's going to tell a second story with only human survivors.